Monday, and welcome back to the Lorden Arts channel. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here today. Case Cracked is the show where we look into a mystery and what are the critical pieces that help solve that mystery. Today's episode is one that the police would call the unsolvable case. Have you ever woken up to start your day expecting it to be just like the day before, only to be jarred from your regular routine with something that will trouble you for the rest of your life? On August 11th, 1987, that's exactly what happened to motorway employees working on the A-10 just outside of Blois, France. Around 3.20 p.m., workers found the lifeless body of a child wrapped in a blanket in a ditch at kilometer point 135. They immediately called police. Between investigators' reports and an autopsy, it was found that the motorway crew had found the body of a little girl. She was about three feet tall and around the age of four. She had black curly hair and dark skin and was dressed in underwear and a gown. Her body showed signs of new and old abuse that included broken bones, human bite marks, and burns from a clothing iron. Most disturbingly, she had died from a hemorrhage. Missing children's cases were looked at from all over the area, but none matched the description of the young girl. Investigators named her the little martyr of the A-10 and continued working on what would turn out to be one of France's largest investigations. No identification was found with the little martyr, but evidence from the scene was gathered and preserved. Photographs of the young girl were put on posters and hung in public areas, and an alert for information about her life and death was sent to 30 different countries. The little martyr's DNA was taken, and traces of foreign DNA were found on the blanket she was wrapped in, as well as her clothes. Investigators just had no way to match it to anyone. At the start of the school year, literally thousands of schools were visited, but no one knew who the little martyr was. Investigators also reached out to 6,000 doctors and childminders, or nannies, who were also questioned, but still no one could figure out who she was. With no leads to go on, the little martyr was eventually buried in nearby loire et -Cher. A lone policeman and the mayor of the village carried her tiny coffin to an unmarked grave covered in white gravel that would become her final resting place. This case would continue to baffle French police for decades, and in 1997, it was declared unsolvable. In 2008, when new advancements in DNA technology became available, the little martyr sample was registered with a national genetic database. No matches were found. In 2012, her case was reopened. Investigators hung new flyers with a picture of the girl that asked, who is she? In 2016, a man was ordered to give a DNA sample after his arrest in an unrelated assault case. He was found to share a familial match to the little martyr. After a few months of digging through his family tree, his parents, 66-year-old Ahmed Tulub and 66-year-old Halima Tulub, were found to be a direct match to DNA found on the little girl's clothing and blanket. They would turn out to be the little martyr's parents. Records showed that for years, the couple claimed welfare payments for three girls and four boys. Eventually, they stopped claiming payouts for one of their daughters, who was named Ines. When a passport and other papers for Ines were found, it confirmed that she was indeed the little martyr of the A-10. Born to a wealthy family, 28-year-old Halima worked as a teacher in her home of Casablanca, Morocco, while she cared for two young daughters she shared with Ahmed. In 1982, she decided to move to the Paris suburb of Val-de-Marne, France, with the children to be with Ahmed, who had arrived there earlier. Soon, Halima became pregnant with their third child, but insisted she wanted the birth to take place back in Casablanca. On July 3rd, 1983, Ines was born in Casablanca, Morocco. She would spend the first year and a half of her life with her grandparents in Morocco while her parents moved back to France. Apparently, their marriage was having significant challenges. Through questioning and court proceedings, both of their stories would come out. Ahmed claims that Halima suffered mental disorders upon her arrival to France. 
that's a direct quote, by the way. Uh, she said that the new country made her feel ill, and she regretted leaving her teaching position. By this time, their family had their fourth baby, a boy. After the new baby's birth, Ahmed began to notice that Ines was thin and showed signs of being beaten. When he asked what happened, each time he was told that Ines was clumsy and fell a lot. He pleaded with Halima to allow Ines to stay with her parents in Morocco, but she refused and also refused to get treatment for her mental health. From here, according to Ahmed, things between the two would become much worse. On August 10th, 1987, the Tulib family was readying themselves for a drive to Morocco. When Ahmed arrived home, he stated he found Ines laying dead on their sofa. When he asked his wife what happened, she dismissively replied that the four-year-old had fallen down the stairs. By this point, Ines's abuse had hit new levels. She had bite marks and even burns on her body. Two of Ines's sister told their father that mommy had pushed their sister down the stairs. Many options filled the man's mind. First and foremost, he wanted to call the police and report his wife. Fear of losing his children stopped that idea. He didn't want Halima to treat the other children with the same rage she took out on Ines, but he also decided to stay silent out of fear of the woman. He said that living with her was terrifying, as she was unpredictable and violent. She had struck him more than once, and one of those times was with a baseball bat. He then decided to pack his family up and load them into their car. Ines was wrapped in a blanket and held by Halima in the front seat, he then started the drive to Morocco. On the A-10, while his other children slept, Ahmed pulled the car over and Halima placed Ines in the ditch, still covered in her blanket, and left her. She was discovered about six hours later. Ahmed stated that he lived with Halima until their last child became an adult and left the house. The two then separated and divorced. When the other children were questioned, it was found the couple's oldest child remembers that Ines was a little girl who didn't speak much, whom she played with in Paris. When she talked of her mother, she stated that she was a woman, quote, suffering from everything, who was always having some kind of crisis. She would tear her clothes and shake her children in anger, but moments later, act like nothing had happened. During these fits, the oldest child remembers her mother biting Ines. Forensic testing would show that bite marks were from a woman. It couldn't be proven that the woman was Halima, but it did show that, that it definitely wasn't Ahmed. The night of Ines's death, the eldest sister remembers fighting and crying between her parents after she saw her sister at the bottom of the stairs. She claims not to know if the death was accidental or intentional, she remembers the stop on the highway, but nothing else about the night other than her mother telling her to never tell anyone what she saw. Anessa's other sister remembers a father who always worked and a mother with abrupt changes in behavior. She has no memory of Anessa at all. Halima claims that the violent one was her husband and that she only occasionally became violent with Anessa. She then claimed that Ines was alive and well in Morocco with her husband and three children. When this was found to be a lie, she then changed the story and claimed that Ahmed was the one that killed their daughter and dumped her body. She said his violence became worse after she asked him to accept help from an organization that helps to resolve marital problems. When faced with her daughter's testimonies, which clearly contradict her own, she claimed that they were too young to remember anything about that time. In June of 2018, Ahmed and Halima were found to both be living in Orleans and were arrested at their separate homes. They were charged with the crimes of murdering a minor, violence against a minor, and concealing a corpse. When gendarmes, or the French armed police that handle rural areas, arrived at Ahmed's door, he expressed his relief that they were finally there and said, quote, I've been waiting for your arrival for 31 years. In June of 2019, both Ahmed and Halima were released from prison and placed at their homes under house arrest. They are both electronically surveilled by authorities as they await trial. The trial 
is still pending. So, of course, we have to remember they are innocent until proven guilty. Halima now claims that her memories of the night in question are fading, and she's failing to remember certain details. She still proclaims her innocence and says, My children, I love them. The community has not forgotten Ines. Many still travel to her grave and leave flowers and notes under the tombstone that reads, Here rests an angel. Case cracked. I would like to thank BBC.com, NewsRND.com, TellerReport.com, The Hindustan Times, and CloserMag.fr. Of course, the biggest thank you goes to Christy Arnhart for researching and writing up today's case, and here she is now to discuss it with us. It's angering, Christy. Like, there's just no other way around it. This is just such a terrible situation. And, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know that relationships can be complex, and having abuse elements that are happening in these relationships can really tilt things, but I'm kind of mad at the father as well. And then, uh, you know, on, on top of all this, house arrest for killing yeah. your child? Like, they're both being charged at this point, and they're both able to, like, go home. Like, I just, how does that happen? How, how are it they? Is. How are they? It's infuriating. They caught house arrest because of COVID. Both of them are of an age and they had enough health problems that they sent them home. Okay. But okay. It, it doesn't seem right to me either. And yeah, as far as being angry with the father, so angry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's, man, I, of course, thinking of COVID, I mean, that's probably delaying the court proceedings mm -hmm. and everything. Um, which, yeah, I, I know that, you know, we're calling this a case cracked, but honestly, we don't know what's going to happen in that yeah. trial. I mean, I think with the, forensic evidence that we're talking about. Um, the problem is there's a little bit of a finger pointing finger situation that's going on here. Mm -hmm. um, the children's testimony, I think, is going to be kind of the breaking point, at, at least from you know the information that we know about the case at this point. I know during the trial that there'll be other details that come out. Um, oh, yeah. But do I really think that it's going to flip to be the father's sole responsibility? I don't think so. But if they charge him with partial responsibility in some way, certainly for concealing a corpse, like how do you get mm -hmm. out of that? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's going to be really interesting to see how all that shakes out. Yes. Um, and how is her mother's story still that she didn't do this? And now she has this convenience of, Oh, by the way, my memory is, Oh, I'm, so, I'm forgetting, forgetting what happened. Yeah. yeah isn't terrible. that convenient? Yeah. She has religiously said, I did not do this. I did not kill my daughter. Even as late as 2018, she told a judge that Ines was still living during their drive. It was later during the trip that she said she noticed that she was breathing less and less until she just breathed her last. I, I, let's flip it for a second. Mm -hmm. Taking out the whole abuse scenario, which it sounds like they have stacks of proof of and they're not going to have any any issue proving. But let's say that that's not what happened. Uh, you're driving somewhere. You got a perfectly healthy child with with you. You're holding on to them. Uh, their breathing becomes labored. And they pass away and you stop and you ditch the you put the body in a ditch like it. The, the logic of this, like none of it is is holding up no. and there's still you know, where, where's the parental responsibility here? Like, you know, take the child to a hospital. If you think that they're having some type of medical event or something like that, like, mm -hmm. uh, so frustrating, but it, it really feels like this is Halima is she's a woman that doesn't live in reality is, is what no. it seems like. Um, no. And it seemed that way to me too. Yeah. But maybe, uh, spending some time in, in prison will, will help her understand what reality is. I don't know. Uh, Something else that kind of gets me about cases of this nature uh, is one of the big struggles I've had since I've started doing this work and looking, you know, at several cases a week and weeks after weeks, months after months, now years after years of doing this work. Mm -hmm. It's very obvious to me that sentences for crimes against children are shorter, particularly homicide. Mm -hmm. I don't get it. I, I don't know why, but it's it's obvious. And it to me, it seems backwards because if, you know, if uh, someone murders an adult that is 60 or 70 years old, they have robbed that person of, 
you know, 15 to 30 years of life. If you kill a child that is four years old, you've taken more. You, you've taken 70, 80 years of life. Like, shouldn't, shouldn't those sentences kind of line up with the, the logic of what was actually taken? It's just, it's completely backwards the way it works right now. It, it's ridiculous. And let me throw this out here. Yeah. This is an art from an article that the Denver Post ran in 2012. And it says that when children die of abuse and neglect, prosecuting their killers is difficult. Convictions can be elusive, sentences tend to be short, and often charges are never filed at all. Those responsible for their deaths are likely to serve significantly less prison time than those who kill adults. It's insane. It's it doesn't insane. make any sense. No, no. Um, other information from that same article, uh, murder cases specifically, typically they get a 25% shorter sentence than if it was an adult. I mean, I, the thing I usually hear is uh, like around six or seven years. Mm -hmm. Six or seven years for taking a life. It's insane. Uh, for abuse for abuse cases, which they have to compare against something. So this article, they compared them to class three felony assault, mm -hmm. which effectively, if, you know, if you're abusing a child, that would be abuse. Uh, but for an attack on another adult, that would be a class three felony. The sentences are 42% shorter for what happens to a child. And other experts in that article talk about it being a national problem. In one case that they cite in that article, father literally received a 90-day sentence for killing his daughter. That makes no sense whatsoever. None. None. And there, it, it's a really good article. We, we, we'll put it at the top of the sources. I know it's a tough subject, but if you're really... Uh, if, if it grabs you that there's something wrong with all this, just take a moment and take a look at that article and go through it. There are challenges with prosecuting those cases. I get it, but I'm not even talking about uh, the cases that don't make it to trial, which obviously you've pointed out. There's a bunch that they, they never get there. And I know that some of those cases are tough because you're talking about what happens in the four walls of a home. Yeah. But uh, for the cases that do make it, still the sentencing is so light. And those things, those justifications, I don't know. They just don't seem to work for me. But No, they don't work for me either. Yeah. And I know you're left with uh, several questions. What What do you think? Well, it just breaks my heart. Every time I, do, I cover a case like this or any case, I'm able to put in who the victim was you know, what they had accomplished, what their personality was like, right. something. Right. All we know about her is that she didn't talk much. Right. That's terrible. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, who would she have been? What did she like? What was her favorite color? Yeah. What What would she have brought to this world? And yes. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's already tragic when we look at the cases that we do and we're talking about the ripple effect of all the family and people that are touched by that loss mm -hmm. um but here you can't even begin to really measure it like in yeah. a case with an adult you can you could literally start to quantify some of it say oh they had a family of 20 people at work there was 30 people they interacted with like you could try to figure out the ripple even then you're still not going to get it right but you could yeah. you could try to understand the scope of what a loss is for a four-year-old like this who's Parents seem to not care. It's it's a whole different thing to try to measure. Um, I just want to thank anyone that has watched this episode. Uh, these cases are really, really tough. We don't cover them a whole lot because yeah. they're so hard to work on. They're so difficult to talk about. Uh, but it obviously is important. These cases do happen too much. And there's mm -hmm. um, different considerations here that don't get spoken about very often. And you won't find this type of talk going on with major media as well. So, uh, I mean, look, the, the main source that I found for our stats, we're talking about an article from 2012. Yeah. So uh, I really appreciate you guys hanging in there for that. There's not a lot of info about the current status of what's going on with this trial. And keep in mind, this is a case obviously happening, happening in another country. So I just want to put a call out to any of our international friends out there. If you hear any updates on the trial, uh, please send them our way. You can send it to me directly, john at lordandarts.com. Uh, I just want to make sure that we keep up to date with what's happening on this and see if justice fully arrives. I have a feeling it's going to. Yeah. Um, but uh, we're still in a little bit of a holding pattern on that. 
Christy. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you on this one. I really feel like they're going they're going to be charged regardless of what they say. I just don't know who's going to be charged with what. And I'm curious about the sentencing. I'm curious to oh, see yes. what happens with the sentencing around this. I'm I'm kind of disappointed that they're on house arrest as it is. I understand yeah. we're talking COVID era, so this is different. But uh, yeah, Christy, uh, I know that this was some tough work for you to do. Just wanted to tell you I really appreciate you um, pulling this together and and sharing her story with us. And to your point, I wish that we understood more of how special this this little girl is. But unfortunately, none of us will come to learn that. No. Thank you so much. And I've got some other people to thank right now. Thank you, PayPal supporters Jennifer Wilson, Larissa Mertschink, and Hillary Green. We've always featured limited commercials and no commercial interruptions during our presentations. And we really appreciate those of you that support us directly to allow us to continue doing that. If you would like to support the channel, please visit lordandarts.com. There you can sign up for Patreon, sign up for PayPal, buy merchandise, or even just buy us a coffee, like Marie Conant recently did. Remember, you can hear another Lord and Art story every week on the Seriously Mysterious podcast. New episodes are released on Tuesdays. Visit seriouslymysterious.com and remember to subscribe on your favorite podcatchers. While you're here, click that subscribe down below and click that bell icon if you want to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows. Now, our schedule is we're taking a break from here until December 31st. What happens on December 31st? Well, if you haven't been able to catch one of our weekly Secret Studio live shows, you can join us at the unsecret studio session that we're doing on New Year's Eve at 1 p.m. Central. You'll get to chat with me live. You'll hear a gripping mystery as we record a podcast episode together. Then we're going to play some games before I send you off to celebrate in your special way New Year's Eve us rolling into 2022. I hope that you will join us live 1 p.m. Central, December 31st, right here on the Lord and Arts channel.